A new session with Benjamin Barr uh, talking about corpse graining and entanglement. And right, so should, should we wait for Jurek? Maybe. See you well, around? we should wait for Jurek, but he should be on time too. Okay. <laughs> well, he's the birthday child. That's true. Here he is, mm -hmm. so you can start. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to this afternoon session. It is a great pleasure to be here. On this, on this great occasion, uh, talking about operator spin form models. Um, apparently, it seems to be customary to tell the story about how you first met with, with your. <laughs> Actually, the first time that I saw Jurek wasn't really the time I met Jurek. I think it was in the Marcel Grossman meeting in 2006, uh, when I had already heard stories about Professor Lewandowski. But when I first saw him, I think he was about twice as big as I suspected to be, so I was so intimidated that I actually hardly ever spoke to him. I think we shook hands, and that was it then. But, uh, but then when my PhD supervisor, Thomas Thiemann, told me that I should go to Warsaw and actually talk about my work, and I did, I realized that Jurek is actually, uh, well, he, he is a very large person, uh, both in life and in body, but uh, I found out that he's one of the most friendly and helpful and nice persons that I've ever met, and I'm actually very happy to be part of the same community as he is. There's one paper that Jurek and I have, uh, where we both are authors, and that's actually the one which is called Operator Spin for Models, I think Definition and Coarse Graining. So I decided that um, I will actually talk a little bit about the work that he and I have done together, so this is a bit of a review. I actually realized that there's another person who is also on that, art, on that paper who is speaking after me, so there might be some overlap, but I hope it won't be too, too large. So I will talk a little bit about the way that, that people talked about spin foams about 10 years ago when, when Jurek and I were, and other people were, were writing on this paper, and that when we called this operator spin foam models, I might just give a basic definition um, and some properties, but I think Martin, who will speak after me, will probably do this in much more detail. And then I will talk about one very specific operator spin form model, which is a nice toy model for the EPIL model, which is what I call this hypercuboidal operator spin form model. And there's you, although it's not very physical in the sense that you wouldn't expect it to describe quantum gravity, there are some nice features. First of all, you can do some computations, and second of all, there are some nice features that one could expect also to be present in the actual EPIL model. So this is some kind of test laboratory. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about the RG flow of this model, and then afterwards I will talk a little bit about something. So, so these are some, some older results, but these are some newer results about entanglement entropy of physical states in this model. Okay, so uh, as a motivation. Um, we have already heard quite a lot about this, uh, about Jurek's role in, in loop quantum gravity, and I will just uh, go over this very briefly. So you know that Jurek is, was a very vitally part of the construction of the loop quantum gravity Hilbert space, in particular uh, this capital L back there, that's Jurek. And um, in this, in this uh, great Hilbert space, this kinematical Hilbert space, there's a nice orthonormal basis given by generalization of Penrose's spin network functions, which you can think of as uh, quantized three-dimensional geometry. And on the kinematical level, that's very nice. Uh, the dynamics is very difficult to actually uh, pinpoint down, so there are, uh, there's a formulation in terms of constraints, um, which you should use in order to construct a physical inner product, but um, because technically you need some spectral decomposition of complicated operators, that's, that's actually a very hard problem, although many people are doing quite a lot of uh, fantastic work in regards uh, to this. Um, there is some sort of attempt at trying to get around this problem by, by making an ansatz for this physical inner product, and that's uh, using uh, so-called spin form models as histories of three geometries. So you can think of these states here as 
uh, some geometry on one Cauchy surface and here another Cauchy surface and there's some sort of dynamics between them. Although this dynamics in an ordinary theory would be some sort of transition operator here because the, uh, GR is a constrained, completely constrained theory. This is more akin to the matrix element in the physical in a product. So this is some ansatz that you can make for that and there are several different models that people were actually thinking about. Uh, the first four-dimensional one that I know was actually the Barrett Crane spin form model, then working, uh, building on results from, from et al. and uh, Simone, people built this so-called EPIL model, so Engler, Pereira, Rovelli, Levine, uh, two of Ang uh, Jonathan and Carlo are actually here, and then also the Friedel Krasnov models, which were defined on four simplices. There were also other models uh, which were not defined on four simplices. Um, uh, and there was also a GFT model, or GFT motivated model by, by Daniela Oriti. So then it, it was around this time when there were several different um, proposals for which kind of model you should take uh, came onto the market. And in particular, um, in a very nice paper, uh, Jurek, Marcin, and um, Wojtek extended this, uh, this model, which um, for gamma less than one and your Euclidean signature, they're actually the same, so I just use EPL FK, uh, to, to extend the definition of that to actually have uh, a model on arbitrary two complexes, which is very nice because then the relation with uh, the original loop quantum gravity was actually much, uh, much stronger. Um, and then uh, what happened afterwards is that uh, Jurek and some collaborators actually realized that um, uh, there's a general class of models that you can uh, sort of more generally defined along these sorts of lines, and that's something that uh, we called uh, operator spin form models back then. Um, and that's very nice uh, because those are really very useful for renormalization. Uh, at least that was, it was my uh, motivation. Now the problem is that uh, Jurek doesn't like the word renormalization. Uh, <laughs> So, but he likes the word cylindrical consistency. <laughs> so I, I, please, whenever I say renormalization, I want you to imagine that I actually say something along the lines of cylindrical consistency or maybe inductive <laughs> limit. Um, okay, so let's actually talk about operator spin form models, just going through the definitions rather briefly. Uh, the ingredients for this are some oriented two complex delta. You have a compact gauge group, a compact Lie group, I mean G, and uh, some class function. W from G to C, and uh, an important ingredient is that for each tensor product of irreducible representations of G, where you have a bunch of representations and duals, you need to make a choice of some operator. And this operator is supposed to map the tensor product of all of these representations to itself. Okay, if you have made this choice, uh, what you can then do is you can define what is a state on delta. A state on delta is actually a distribution of irreducible representations of G to the two cells, which people also call the faces of this delta. So this is a two-complex and there are these two-dimensional faces and they meet at edges. So if you have such a state, uh, which is for each F an, uh, an irreducible representation, you can define the edge Hilbert space which for each edge, for each one cell here, you can define a Hilbert space, which is uh, the tensor product of all irreducible representations of faces meeting at that edge. But um, since these are, have orientations, you ha should take the actual representation when the orientations agree, for instance, with F1 and the edge here. And you should take the dual representation if the orientations disagree, like with F4 here and uh, you take this tensor project, and uh, by our original rule, we um, sort of have this operator associated to that now. And um, if you have this bunch of operators, then you can form the vertex trace. Uh, and this vertex trace, unfortunately in formulas, is very nasty to write down. It's much easier to say it in words. Um, on every vertex, you have a bunch of free indices, and you contract the, the indices. The, the ones that uh, belong to each face. So uh, this operator here has some, uh, uh, some domain of definition and some range. So this is the beginning of the edge. This is associated to the end of the edge. So uh, for an example here, this is a vertex in our cell complex. This is a face. This is an edge going in and outwards. And uh, the P 
associated to E in its uh, has it's actually one index which is associated to the F to, to the vertex coming from the uh, face F here and E1 has the same thing and they are in opposite in opposite position so you can contract them with the delta function and you can con contract all of them and uh, that's uh, you can contract all of them which is also called the vertex trace you do this for every vertex then there are no indices left if the whole thing has no boundary and then you also multiply that's where this function w comes in. You multiply with the Fourier coefficient of this uh, function w. So that's something that you can do for a state. And if it converges, you can also sum over all of these states. So you can do this thing for every state. And then you can, if you like, you sum over all of the irreducible representations. And that's called the spin form state sum. And that's something that uh, is rather nice. And uh, you can also rewrite this as sum over irreducible representations and intertwiners, well, not intertwiners yet, of amplitudes. And uh, then you get back your original spin foam picture. Um, if you have a boundary, uh, which is not necessarily connected, you are talking about a subgraph gamma of this two complex. And um, those are supposed to be all edges uh, with only one face, which are called links, and uh, they meet at all vertices with only one edge. So I, some, for some time, I tried to convince Jurek that there are also more general and also other definitions of what the boundary graph should be, but he didn't like it, so I'm using his definition here. Uh, right, so this fits very well into this picture. So for instance, this face here, uh, well, at least down here in the, in the neighborhood of, of this thing, this has uh, this, this edge here has only one face attached to it, this face here, this edge has only one face to, attached to it, and this edge here uh, has, sorry, this, this vertex down there, which I haven't drawn, has only one edge attached to it, and you form them, this form this graph, and that form that graph. Um, for these, you can define a boundary Hilbert space very similarly to the way that you have defined the edge Hilbert spaces here. You essentially take the tensor product of all of the, all of the edge Hilbert spaces uh, for those nodes, um, and uh, then you can find that with a, with a proper definition, this uh, spin foam state sum actually turns into a linear space, a linear form on the boundary Hilbert space, which is, which is very nice. Uh, in particular, it's, uh, the, if the boundary decomposes in an in and an out part, uh, that actually gives a nice bilinear or sesquilinear form on uh, the uh, in Hilbert space and out Hilbert space. So I think this, this, uh, this should be a bilinear form on this. So if it's sesquilinear, then I think the stagger should be, should be gone. So if you like, these are, these are something like the face, face amplitudes for if you come from the spin from pictures. And these are lots of vertex amplitudes. And you can use these uh, states as, uh, as input. And then these, you can also rewrite them. And then these actually become operators, operators from this space to that space. And there are all kinds of nice properties that you can use, so depending on what kind of operators P you choose, so um, you can make the whole thing independent of the choice of orientations of your two-complex. You can uh, demand that the image, additionally, the image of these operators are part of the invariant subspace on each edge Hilbert space. That uh, means that this linear form then is a gauge invariant on the boundary Hilbert space. Um, that on, can also be rewritten actually as a sum over invariant elements or intertwiners. Um, and also then that means that this thing is invariant under trivial subdivisions of faces. So if you just take a face and you just cut it in two by inserting another edge, then the value doesn't change. A uh, similar thing, if you actually make this into a projector, then it's also invariant under trivial subdivisions of edges. And there are some nice composition laws. And it's not just that these have nice properties. There are actual real-world examples for this, which is why I think this is so nice, because there are several different things fitting into this framework. One of them is actually lattice young mills theory, where the two-complex is dual to a cubic lattice, um, where the Ps are actually just the Haar projectors. So this is the, the largest gauge invariant projectors that you can have. And uh, the interesting part is this W here, which becomes the Wilson action around the plaquettes. Uh, there's also BF theory, which is um, a topological quantum th field theory where this W formally goes to the delta function, um, where you can actually easily rewrite this as a sum over or an integral over all flat connections, where 
so this is the delta function on the group, and this capital H is the holonomy around faces. Right, but also uh, the Euclidean Barrett Crane model uh, that I described to you can be written in this way, where this P is just a projection onto a one dimensional vector, or a, yes, a projector onto this one dimensional subvector space, which is spanned by the so called Barrett Crane intertwiner. Um, and then the KKL extension of the EPILFK model is, that's actually the, the nice thing, the, the motivation that we started this is where these operators actually map onto a very specific subspace which are co is called the solutions to the simplicity constraints and actually quite a lot of work went into uh, the, uh, the attempt at defining which, which space one should actually, actually take here. So trying to find what, define what the solution to the simplicity constraints is, is sort of the main game. So cho choosing this, this correct sub, sub vector space. Um, there's also lots of further development and generalizations of this because time did not stop at, uh, in the year 2010, obviously, and many people have looked at further generalizations or looked at different, different ways to, to use this for um, useful, uh, for, for useful work. So there's uh, trying uh, to use this really in terms of a Feynman diagrammatic approach. Um, and I think Jacek Puchta and uh, other people here in Warsaw have been very much involved in that. There's a dual holonomy formulation that people use. There's, uh, obviously, there's the non-compact group version of that, which you need for Lorentzian signature, which works similar, apart from the fact that there are more divergencies, which you have to be very careful to take care of. Um, there's a possibility of not contracting at each vertex with a Kronika delta, but actually with a non-trivial operator which is a nice way of introducing a cosmological constant at that point. Another nice way of introducing a cosmological constant is to replace the group by a quantum group, which additionally, actually, in many cases, also makes the model finite, which is quite nice. And then there's several different proposals for how to not use spin network functions, so actually change the Hilbert spaces and questions that one use, but uh, use maybe these fusion networks or maybe things working. Uh, built on two groups, which is something that I think Bianca Dittrich very recently uh, worked quite a lot about and is very excited about it. Uh, there's also a question of um, how to uh, sum over all of these deltas, which leads you into the group field theories and tensor field theory framework. There are different uh, attempts to getting uh, rid of uh, a specific cosine issue, which I will not explain. Um, by changing uh, the definition of this amplitude, uh, replacing it with something that's called the proper vertex, and also introducing some non-localities by trying to uh, find uh, a proper implementation of this volume simplicity constraint. So there's many, many things, and there's many more that you can uh, do with that. And um, that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the history of operator spin for models, if you like. OK, very quickly. Now, this is a nice thing that you have a large class of models, because now what you can do is you can look at renormalization, uh, or rather coarse training, if you like. So what you can do is uh, you can try to use it as, as I said in the beginning, you can try to use this as, an, as a proposition for, for the physical inner product uh, of two states. But no, that's not. these boundary states are not really the full boundary Hilbert spaces that you would like, but, but they are only defined on some graph. And maybe you would like to have a finer graph. And the transition itself depends on this delta, uh, which only depends on finite, transports finitely many degrees of freedom. And maybe you want actually to have a higher resolution of your theory, and you want more degrees of freedom, and have a finer uh, two-complex. OK, so what you should do is you should actually try to get to the physical Hilbert space, which contains information about all the graphs. And you can think of this as some kind of continuum limit. And uh, there are many people who have uh, already for quite some time worked on this sort of problem. And the only thing that I will, uh, I will go through this very briefly and just telling you that uh, after, some, after some choice of embedding maps that you have to make, embedding uh, uh, f some graph here into some finer graph, then um, the, the cylindrical consistency condition for this whole operator gives you some, some condition on the spin net or the operator spin form model on different deltas. Right, so uh, the condition that for different deltas and for different resolution you can glue all of these together actually uh, gives you some sort of 
uh, consistency condition, which you might call renormalization group flow equations. And if you want to find, again, the flow of coupling constants, you can think of this model being parameterized by this, uh, this action W and these parameters P, which are the parameters. Uh, and this equation actually tells you that if you, if you coarse grain uh, a two complex, this results in a, an according change of omega and p. So if you like, this is the sort of picture that you should remember. So you have this, you can even think of this as some sort of commuting diagram, if you like. So here you have some, this embedding map, and here you have this uh, operator, the spin form operator, and you see this, here's this delta, here's the delta dash, the delta dash is finer than the rest. And um, in order for this to be cylindrically consistent, uh, the omega and p over here are not necessarily the same ones down there, and that's called the flow of coupling constants, and leads to something that's called renormalization. Okay, very briefly, I will just now talk about a toy model, um, which uh, is something that some people in my group and myself, we have worked on, in particular, Sebastian Steinhaus, but also others have worked on recently. And um, that's not really the EPIL model, but it's some sort of simplified version of the EPIL model, which uh, can also be written in terms of these operator spin form model language. And you can try to see what, um, what uh, sort of renormalization group flow tells you. In this and, and for this model, so this is not really the renormalization group flow of the EPIL model, but maybe it can teach you some some qualitative features. Okay, so the idea of this is that this is a toy model, which is sort of the modified version of the EPIL FK model, truncated to hypercuboids. Now, if you don't know any technical details about the EPIL FK model, I apologize. Um, I will try to. Uh, still explain what's going on, and for other people you can just look at the technical details if you like. So the important thing here is that this class function is uh, not precisely the uh, phase amplitude that you would have from the EPLFK model, but uh, this uh, function uh, to the power of alpha, where alpha is some free parameter, and this parameter is a parameter that can change. The two complex is also very special because it's dual to a four-dimensional hypercubic lattice, and uh, you can think of this as the four-dimensional hypercubic lattice. And for each, so I haven't drawn the faces in here because that would be too, too much, but uh, for the edges, the edge Hilbert spaces are the ones, the usual ones, but the P's are the operators that I choose are actually projections uh, down to uh, a one dimension for, for specific uh, spins, uh, for specific irreducible representations. This is a projection to a specific one-dimensional subspace, and that one-dimensional subspace uh, is the one that's spanned by what's called a quantum cuboid. So uh, this here is a specific intertwiner, SU2 intertwiner, and uh, with, this, with this boosting map, you can make this into an SU4 intertwiner which with the, for the two spins J plus and J minus. And this is a very specific state which comes from uh, a definition of, uh, so th this is what, what's called a Levin speciale coherent state, which uh, is a, is a th intertwiner which has in the large spin limit, so if you make all of these k large, um, has the interpretation of uh, some cuboid. So uh, this is one of the states that shows up in the uh, EPIL path integral, and there are many of them, and they are all different uh, polytopes and shapes, but here we only have one, and that's the sort of uh, cuboid, which has three parameters, which is the three areas, or equivalently, three lengths. So, so, so the lengths of these cubes are allowed to fluctuate now, and the rest is not allowed to fluctuate. And essentially what this boils down to is that the sum over spins and intertwiners is now truncated down to the sum over these quantum cuboid. And as I said, it's much simpler Thank you. It's much sim simpler than the EPIL FK KKL model, um, but still retains some interesting features. Right. In particular, what you can do is you can look at the coarse graining step. So, naively, what you would do, for instance, is that you uh, coarse grain two times two times two, so sixteen to one hypercuboid. So, uh, in this picture where you have this large four-dimensional lattice, you always take sixteen of them and glue them together to one one big one. Um, so that's what you do on the level of two complexes. And uh, on this here, you have uh, as free parameter alpha dash, right? Because this is delta dash, this is a fine one. And here you have the parameter alpha. And here you have 
uh, this, this delta. So there's a specific choice for this embedding map, which uh, is essentially uh, a very geometrical way of embedding this coarse uh, quantum cuboid into the tensor product of eight finer hypercuboids. And uh, because many of these calculations were just working in the large spin limit, essentially this alpha really is the only coupling constant in that case. So maybe you know that there's this barbaro amezi parameter, but in this large spin asymptotic limit, uh, that is just a prefactor. So all of that falls out. And also Newton's constant, for instance. Uh, if you want to put it in by hand into the model, it just, just falls out. Because essentially this whole model is flat and flatness doesn't see anything about Newton's constant. Okay, so alpha is the only coupling constant. So what you can do is you can do this coarse graining step. You, so alpha dash turns into alpha and then you can iterate that procedure and see where this flow of the alpha leads you. And uh, this is sort of the, the standard uh, picture that I like to show in this, in this context. So there's this, this uh, orange curve is alpha depending on alpha dash. So on, on this flow and this curve here is alpha equals alpha dash. Uh, which is uh, the 45, would be the 45 degrees diagonal if these two um, scales would be the same, but they're not, and there's a, this flow has a fixed point. Uh, and this fixed point lows at a very specific value for alpha, and uh, it's unstable, which in the language of quantum field theory renormalization means it's, it's UV attra attractive. I'm sorry, there's a mistake. So it's a, uh, if you, it's, it's a repulsive when you flow to the, uh, uh, to the infrared and in the UV, therefore, it becomes attractive. And it splits this phase diagram in two different regions, so something which is larger and something which is smaller. Um, and uh, here we have chosen a specific boundary state. Uh, if, you choose, if you change the boundary state a little bit, then the position of this point uh, actually changes a bit uh, to the left and to the right, but it roughly stays, stays where, it are, where it is. So you can also do this with uh, other geometries, not the, not the hypercuboidal ones that I've shown you, and then you uh, essentially get a very similar picture. Um, you can also look at fluctuations of certain observables, uh, gauge variant observables, uh, which, uh, and then look at these fluctuations when you increase the lattice size, when you make the lattice size larger, uh, then you can see that these fluctuations actually diverge as well and become more and more sharp, from which you can read off something like critical exponents if you're interested in these sorts of things which I, I'm not for this moment. Uh, what I would like to talk about in the very end is uh, so-called entanglement entropy, um, which now is something rather different suddenly, but I would like to talk about entanglement entropy of states in the physical Hilbert space of this hypercuboidal, um, of this hypercuboidal model. And in particular, the physical Hilbert space now also depends on alpha because alpha is the sort of choice of the model that I make. And uh, we can see that this entanglement entropy of some states uh, also behaves uh, in a very particular way with, this, with respect to this parameter. And that, that's what I'd like to talk about. Now, now, just a very brief recap, and many of you will know this, obviously, that uh, entanglement entropy is a property between complementary regions A and B in space. So you have one region, and essentially you have the, uh, the rest, which is outside. And uh, this, this measures the entanglement of the degrees of freedom inside and the degrees of freedom outside of B. Now, generically, uh, for generic states, uh, this entanglement entropy scales with the number of degrees of freedom that you have, uh, so with the volume uh, of the region. But for very interesting states, in particular those ground states for interesting physical theories, those actually scale uh, with just with the area of, uh, of the region, if you make the region larger. And that's actually a way for people to find the ground states of Hamiltonians, look for states which have a very, which uh, satisfy this area law. Um, it's also a very interesting quantity in loop quantum gravity. Uh, some people have also uh, linked this to, to black hole entropy. Uh, and uh, there's, there's many, many people who have, who have uh, looked at this in, in the context of uh, states in loop quantum gravity, uh, but mostly for kinematical states, so actually for spin network functions. And I would like to look at physical states now. Um, okay, so the general framework is uh, easy when you have a factorizing Hilbert space, when the Hilbert space is a tensor product of the Hilbert space of degrees of freedom of A and the degrees of freedom of B, uh, then you do what my previous speaker has already shown you. You produce the reduced density matrix by tracing out the density matrix of the state psi with respect to one set of degrees of freedom, and you uh, take the... Um, essentially the, the, the Shannon entropy here of, of uh, the 
of uh, the, the remaining density matrix, and that gives you a number. Now, for non-factorizing Hilbert space, there's some sort of generalization to that, which uh, I was told by Eugenio Bianchi uh, is the right thing to, to use in this sort of context. I cannot vouch for that, but it gives me nice results in the end, so I'm just going to take it. Namely, if you have uh, a Hilbert space, which is a direct sum of these tensor products, and the first factor always refers to degrees of freedom in A, and the second one in degrees of freedom of B, then you can just decompose the state into uh, the respect of all of these subspaces. And then the entanglement entropy is just a weighted sum of all of the individual entanglement entropy minus the von Neumann entropy of this decomposition over here, where these uh, p's are just absolute norm squared of this ci. So there's also a way to define entanglement entropy for, for this more uh, generalized case. Um, right, and in the following, I would like to talk about the entanglement entropy of physical Hilbert space in this hypercuboidal spin form model. Um, and in the physical Hilbert space, because of this cylindrical consistency, actually several different kinematical states are on different graphs are identified. In particular, one of these cubes should be equivalent to several ones with some prefactors. And these prefactors are the result of the, of the path integral, if you like. So the coefficient actually is the, the physical inner product between those, between those states. And, uh, we use uh, the standard embedding map plus a spin form transition for, for using this sort of physical embedding map from here to here. So we take one cuboid and then we split that into two. And then we take a spin form operator. So we make a path integral here, if you like, and that is this z depending on alpha. And the fine, fine state or the final state is uh, then depends on some prefactors, which you can compute. And uh, if you compute those, right, obviously I need to tell you what my regions A and B are. A and B are just those, those two dots here, right? So one, this is the region A, this is the region B. Um, I won't go through the com computations in, in detail because there's not much time here, but uh, what I would like to do, sometimes I have to wait for a second. Ha, here we go. Is that, uh, so you can, can compute this entanglement entropy which depends on the spin form amplitudes depending on alpha. So uh, this depends on alpha and there's a, there's a maximum. And this maximum is very, very roughly uh, at the same place where the non-Gaussian fixed point is. Um, so this is a very specific example. Again, with some boundary state, if you change the boundary states, then the, then the maximum changes slightly to the left and right, but not very much. Right, so you have this this alpha max. Um, I'm trying to get to the next slide. I hope it, it works. Ah, here we go. Right, so you can also do this uh, into a, with uh, decomposing uh, one state into a, some larger state with, with, with some more boxes here. Then to make a spin form transition. So uh, the physical Hilbert space will be a linear combination of many, many, many of these. You can again make a decomposition into A and B and uh, look at the entanglement entropy. Here, the Hilbert space is not factorizing anymore, so I uh, use uh, Eugenius and Pietro's formula for that, and I get a very sensible formula, and in particular, I get some, some very similar results, so I get a rough, so maybe it goes even a bit below 0 0.5, I'm not quite sure. And again, well, I, so, so this, this roughly is the area where the fixed point is anyway. So I've, I've, I would say that the entanglement entropy actually gets maximal for a, specific value of the coupling constants, which is roughly the same as the renormalization group fixed point. So the RG fixed point is characterized by a maximum of the entanglement entropy of physical state. Uh, and that's an effect that can be expected to actually be more pronounced on larger lattices. And there's some uh, easy way to understand why this is supposed to be the case, namely because of uh, diffeomorphism symmetry. So uh, this, this final state here is a bunch of, consists of a bunch of cubes and depending on what these spins are, so my final physical state is a linear superposition of lots of different cuboids with different spins, so you can think of them as having different shapes um, and different sizes all glued together in a way so that they form a, an actual cuboid. But uh, actually, you're only summing over lots of different ways of how to cut one cuboid into four small ones, 
Right? So in all of these ways of subdividing a big cuboid into lots of small, uh, smaller ones is actually they should all be, they are related by something that's called vertex translation symmetry, which is a remnant of the diffeomorphism symmetry from regicalculus. And actually what we're doing is we're summing over lots of diffeomorphically equivalent uh, states. Again, I'll try to get to the next region, right? And so, so this is actually a visualiz visualization of uh, three states, three physical states. And this is a physical state here at the maximum. This is actually the one where all of the different uh, subdivisions, or many of them at least for a large range, are all, all, all equally present. Uh, here are the ones where only very irregular ones are present. Here are the ones where only very regular ones are present. And if you uh, have a, can, uh, sort of can see what uh, entanglement entropy looks like, then you can see that this state has the maximum entanglement. So all of the different uh, diffeomorphism equivalent degrees of freedom are actually entangled at the RG fixed point. Okay, so I'll just to close very quickly. Um, I gave a very brief review of operator spin form models and I uh, talked about a very specific example, which is a hypercuboidal operator spin form model, which is a nice toy model. And uh, there's the well-known RG flow in this alpha, and there's this well-known uh, non-Gaussian fixed point. And this entanglement entropy is just a very nice additional characterization of what the fixed points of the flow are, because it's exactly at the fixed point where the diffeomorphism degrees of freedom all become entangled. That's sort of when... Uh, diffeomorphism symmetry is restored, which is, which is usually broken far away. So that's a very nice may, way may to be to find uh, interesting points in parameter space. And with that, I close. Thank you very much. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have time just for one question. Yes, go ahead. Yes, you. Uh, so in, the, in this uh, approach to renormalization, mm -hmm. Where you're summing over spins, and it seems right. like that's playing an essential role. But you are also involved in the in the development of the holonomy formulation of spin forms, which is an equivalent formulation. And I'm wondering, yes. can you also view this uh, approach to renormalization in terms of the holonomy formulation? Well, uh, what you need to be able to do is you need to. I mean, the holonomy formulation is essentially just a Fourier transform. So, uh, and. These operator spin form models can be completely rewritten in, in that other form. And in, in the beginning, actually, the renormalization procedure was written down in the holonomy formulation. Um, you have some fewer freedom in what kind of embedding map you can choose. Sometimes the embedding map that I've chosen becomes very horrible to write down in the holonomy formulation. But in principle, that, that should be possible, yes. It's just that the, spin, the summation of a spin is, is more handy in this context, but yes. Okay. I'm sorry, because we are short of time, I propose to thank the speaker again.